Hello and welcome to the newest episode of Before They Knew Better with DIY Magazine. My name is Lisa Wright and this is my co-host and producer Giles Bidder. That's me. On today's episode, we're speaking with Justin Young from The Vaccines. Indie, stalwart, lovely man, and a man about to release his sixth album as The Vaccines. The Vaccines' new album, the very hard to say but very easy to listen to, Pick Up Full of Pink Carnations, is out on the 12th of January. But before then, we asked Justin to bring in... What did we ask him to bring in, Giles? Well, we asked him to bring a photo, a song... And an object, a something, a physical thing that reminds him, that sums up, it's symbolic of his teenagehood. And I feel like Justin's teenage years might be surprising to some people who spent the last decade and a bit listening to the vaccine's solid gold indie earworms because his youth was spent, I mean, in sweaty underground clubs, on skate ramps. Mm -hmm. Upstairs at pubs. On activism demos, which we weren't expecting. Um, Yeah, he was was a surprise, I think, uh, that maybe Justin's iPod was filled with things that we might not have known. It's true. He was a punk. He was a punk, exactly. And you know what? Uh, he's still he's just a he's just a very well dressed punk these days. A nice a nice punk in a sensible shirt. This is it. A, a, a shirt that he can't crowd surf with. Oh yeah, yeah. That's what we also learned as well. There's a very practical reason why you won't find Justin Young crowd surfing these days. Um, but while he is not crowd surfing, he is giving us some wonderful tales on this new episode of Before They Knew Better with DIY Magazine. Keep listening. This show is about being young and the things that affect you from that young age, things that you probably end up carrying around subconsciously or not. Yes. What were the films, kind of visual stuff, do you think, looking back now, reflecting on it now, you're like, okay, yeah, that's that kind of formed me in that in that pretty vital period. Well, the labyrinth gave me like nightmares when I was a real young kid. I remember, I remember sort of like all that, any like puppetry stuff. I was like really freaked out by like never ending story, all that kind of stuff. Mm. Like really, really messed me up. Um, But then I had, you know, I wasn't really like, I I spent my early teens being obsessed with music, but wasn't like particularly into like films beyond like going to Blockbuster and renting Die Hard and stuff. And then when I got to like sick from college, I had a friend who was like really into film, like more than music. And he would, he started like, kind of like, you know, he was like, what do you mean? You've never seen Donnie Darko. And like, you know, like, like, <laughs> like you never seen Stand By Me. And, um, and, and so like, that, and then that was kind of when I guess I started getting into, you know, uh, ticking off some of the classics, I guess. Like you're of the last generation, as I think are all three of us, um, where in the same way that people kind of go like, oh, you know, Spotify has opened up everyone to listening to all kinds of music. Like if we wanted to go and watch a film and it wasn't on the telly, you had to go and rent it out from Blockbuster. Like I think now because you have Netflix and everything, then that's just done the same thing if you're a film nut. Whereas actually it was really easy to go through your entire teenage years having not seen that thing if you just happened yeah. to not be at home yeah. the one time it was like shown on BBC Two. Or getting like, yeah, and then getting someone who had got like a cracked copy of it or something like that, you know, like... Yeah. Um, Do you remember those guys that used to go around like Brick Lane with the um, like burnt... Yeah. CD ROMs yeah. were like trying to flog you like a one pound copy of like, yeah. you know, Shaun of the Dead or something. I had a couple of friends that would buy stuff off them as well. Like it was definitely, um, <laughs> definitely what they definitely weren't without customers. But yeah. And I, I actually think that's like, I do think that, that something that like Gen Z or whatever has, is just this unbelievable like, access to everything. And I do think mm. exposure is taste, right? So like most most of what good taste is is just exposure to things. And I think that people are exposed to so much more at a much younger age now. And obviously that comes with its pitfalls, but it's also like, it's a privilege, I think, to be able to get, yeah, to, to experience so much, I think. Skateboarding growing up, for me and for millions of people, it was like, this is the escape out of my small town. Well, skateboarding was a big part of my life. And I remember... That was also a way, that's how I discovered so much music. Like I used to get that, there was a, there was a, a monthly skateboarding video, which I think still goes 411, like 411. Yeah. Um, and I think it was monthly. And um, 
the soundtracks to that. And again, I would put my tape player next to the t- speaker on the TV and just press re- press record. So then when I was listening to all these songs, there was like <laughs> wheel noises going through them and stuff like that. <laughs> it's old school four tracking. Yeah, exactly. Why do you think that skateboarding and sort of punk or hardcore or those sort of genres are so associated? Well, I think it's like count, it's counterculture, isn't it? And hip hop, hip hop, like in the nineties became like a very big part of skateboarding. Um, and I think it's self-expression and escapism and, 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 you know, I think that for a lot of people, you know, like you were saying, like skateboarding is an escape and so is music and, there's also a big part of, I think that, yeah, that performance as well. And like people, you know, I, th- I know that skateboarders when they got sections on those videos and stuff would think about the music very carefully. And it was like an extension of, you know, mm. putting a mute, like almost like putting music to visuals. It's like, it's like their mm. music video, like the other way around. Whereas like, you know, like artists put visuals to music or something. Yeah. 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 It brings people together. Yeah. I was just reading something about South Bank when it first opened. Oh, there's a great exhibition, actually, Justin, that you could go to at the Design Museum. It's just called Skateboard. Oh, wow. At the weekend, and it's, it's brilliant. It's really good. And I picked up a couple of, spent way too much money in the gift shop. And one of these things is kind of like a big zine. It's like a magazine zine. And then one of the big features was about South Bank when it started. Kids would go down there. It was pretty bleak winter London 70s 80s and they were just saying you know it's amazing to see these people who are rich and poor black and white just this melting pot that i don't really know where else you get that other than music yeah i mean i remember i remember i used to go and um i would go and if i if my dad had like work in london and he was like come on you can come or if like when i started being old enough to come to london on my own i would do two things i would go to camden and buy like band t-shirts and i would go watch skateboarders at south bank that's like the two that to me that's what like london was i always think of you as being a londoner but you grew up not inside yeah i grew up i grew up i grew up um i grew up in the new forest i'm just trying to rewrite history i came to you i came to university in london and i think i'm allowed to call myself a londoner now because that was in 2006 the same year that uh jacob alordi started university in saltburn same year that I started uni also. That's really? the year that all of the... Yeah, that's where everyone comes to London. Yeah. Um, so New Forest, what's that like growing up in as a kid? I would imagine not a whole lot of access to music or skateboarding, all those sort of things. Yeah, there, there, was, like, what, there, was, like, there was like a bus stop that was like a 20-minute walk from my house that had a curb so we could go and like ollie off that. <laughs> um, but there was like mud, you know, I basically lived down like a mud track pretty much so there wasn't much in the way of skateboarding and the music i mean again like i think that most small towns did have record shops um at that time so quite often my mum would if my mum went to the supermarket i remember there was like a record shop opposite the supermarket so even from the age of 10 i think she was like you can just go and stand in there for half an hour while i run in here um and then you could buy you could buy like i could buy sync i had enough you know i had enough pocket money to buy like maybe like one single on tape every time and stuff so actually i guess actually also do you remember i was saying this to someone the other day but my dad used to get these catalogs um and he'd get them in the post every month and you'd send the catalog back with the with the cds you wanted to buy do you remember that i do remember those and he would always let me mm. every month let me choose one as well so i would just nice. pick, so if i'd heard of an if i'd heard of an artist or i like the artwork or whatever i'd be like oh maybe Maybe I'll get that. Like, I remember getting, like, a couple of Eels records. Just, like, yeah. I'd, like, heard of, but, like, wasn't sure why. And so, and and then you'd obviously, like, wait for a couple of weeks for it to come. So, yeah, definitely like, limited, comparatively limited access, but access nonetheless. That was as well when in the back of a CD, you used to get the little card where you could, like, send off to be in the fan club. I was never a fan club of anything, but I, but I do remember, I always think about again like access how um any one of us could dm any kind of person basically on the planet right now and there's like a chance that if you catch mm-hmm. them at the right moment and they're bored they're going to see that and i remember like there were like po boxes basically that you know i would i would quite often write to my favorite band's po boxes 
Um, yeah. <laughs> Who did he write to? Well, one of the reasons I chose the song I chose was because I wrote to them, um, that band, the Ataris, that like yeah, kind of pop punk band, the Ataris, when I was like 13, 14. It's called San Dimas High School Football Rules, and it's by this band, the Ataris. And uh, I, truthfully, some music that I was obsessed with from that time, I think, has aged well, and I've continued to kind of have a relationship with. But I'm, uh, this was kind of a brief window in time, I would say, if I'm being honest <laughs> with you. But it was important nonetheless. And and I think I was about thirteen when I first heard it, and. For whatever reason, probably be because of the clothes they're wearing, the haircuts they had, and the things they were singing about, it just like really can I really it really connected with me, or I connected with it. Um, and I listened back to it when I chose it for the first time in like ten years, just um, <laughs> to the lyrics and stuff, remembering how much they meant to me as a thirteen-year-old boy. And like the guys were probably in their mid twenties at the time, and like the the lyric he's talking about, like crushes and stuff like that but but it's it also and going to disneyland and stuff and it all sounds a bit i don't know silly to me as someone in my 30s but at the time it, it really i don't know i went to see them they're one of the first bands i went to see i went to see them at um astoria 2 in london was like stood behind a um pillar so basically i like, couldn't see it i got like a fake t-shirt out <laughs> like a fake t-shirt outside um, <laughs> but, um and they also did this thing which again i think they this song San Dimas High School Football Rules. They used to invite people up on stage to play it live with them, um, and so people oh, would shit. learn the song. Did you? Uh, no, I didn't. But I know two people that did, or three people that did. Oh. Matt, who's now playing live for the vaccines. Um, my friend Ben Rayner, who's a great photographer who's done a lot of stuff with us as well, also got picked. Just a kind of random, you know, like random sort of points and in different places and stuff and i know someone that got picked in new york i'm trying to remember who it was like another friend got picked to do it in new york and i don't know i also think it's an important record because it i i've been kind of grappling with this and struggling with this recently how um if you if you look at what i don't know how far and wide this uh podcast stretches and i and i think diplomacy as far as you want it to diplomacy is, uh, <laughs> i think diplomacy is uh he, he's he's had I think a couple of melt like meltdowns on stage at other band members in recent years and hasn't come across as particularly the most uh, the nicest guy on the planet maybe um, and uh, one of them I think is now in jail for like white collar crimes um, like fraud oh, wow. I think, like um, and I and you know I there's a there are a group of people uh, my age and around my age we sort of like learnt what we thought romantic love should be from these people, many of whom actually turned out to be quite unsavory characters. <laughs> I mean, that, that era of pop punk, like a lot of them turned out to be quite dodgy people. <laughs> a lot of them went on to be like the biggest songwriters in the world, but then there's also like this chunk of them as well that, and again, that's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying Chris Rowe from the Atari's is, is, is this at all, but, but, <laughs> but I, I, please don't sue us for defamation well, yeah yeah um, uh. i'm not but, but it does lead me to think about like i don't know kind of this sort of sort of this romantic lexicon that we kind of were given and, and their viewpoint mm. you know, every girl was like you know like fuck you and, uh, like fuck you you, you know like they were like it was it was always the girl's fault and like they were always doing something bad to the guy and all this kind of stuff and mm -hmm. i do often stew on that that it was a sort of that was my understanding of romantic love until I kind of experienced it properly, I suppose. And I guess, like, correct me if I'm wrong, because I was never really a big pop punk person, but really not a lot of women in that genre, right? Like, it was like 98%. Yeah, yeah. And I guess that, you know, like, there's very few, there's very few exceptions. I mean, Hayley Williams being one of them, and she talks openly, I think, yeah. about what that was like, you know, her experience. Um, you know, I wasn't, I was too young to be a part of that kind of scene or anything but i was like a fan of it and yeah very very few women i'm trying to think i'm trying to think who else there was from that kind of period but yeah not many then there's that crossover of 
punk rock because when those going into punk rock and hardcore, you know, I feel like those pop punk bands for me and lots of my mates, they were our entry points into kind of more exactly. conscientious. Exactly. They were your sort of, yeah. Those, those were your sort of gateway drugs, I guess. Um, and then, you know, even if you go, I would say that there's, there are also those acts that kind of were somewhere between pop punk and, and punk rock that had a lot more women, like, you, you know, like, there was like Brody Dahl and there were like the Donners and all that, all that sort of stuff mm. that was around the same, that was happening around the same time. and was kind of adjacent to all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You only, you didn't have to stray too far to find like super talented women with like lots to say. It's just for like whatever reason in that little, in that, on that stage and, uh, 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 you know, in those years at that warp tour or whatever, there wasn't much representation. Yeah. Yeah. Did you do things like Warp Tour? Was that like... Uh... The first festival I went to was a festival called like Deconstruction. Yeah. And it was in Finsbury Park. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like, and it was like Lag Wagon, Mad Caddies, I think Lost Profits played, but they got like, uh-huh. they got booed because they weren't pop punk. Who else? Um, all who were like a descendant side project. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember I queued up, I got every single band's autograph, like queued up in the sign. I probably spent more time in the signing tent than I did watching musical day. Um, but it's also funny as well, isn't it? Because, you know, I probably only really liked pop punk for six months, but it, but at that, when you're that age, it's like six years, isn't it? Mm. And it, and like you said, it acts as like the, the gateway into this whole other kind of world. And I think that it definitely sort of changed my life, I guess. The photo that you have brought in, uh, is when you are a teen of how old are we saying there like 15 something like that 14 or 15 because it was my mum's 50th birthday so my, that's my brother on drums um and me on bass and out of shot is my dad on guitar and oh what God. we would do we, and we played a song that we wrote my mum for her birthday and quite often at christmas and for birthdays we would write and record my mum a song. That's the cutest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, that's so Yeah, nice. but I'm wearing a, I think I'm wearing a McMurder t-shirt <laughs> well, with the McDonald's logo because I was a vegan from like 13 to 18 as well and would go on like animal rights marches and stuff like that. I was like very kind of like into all of that stuff, probably through like yeah. hardcore and punk and stuff. So I'm, so I am seeing, I'm playing bass on quite a saccharine, love song that my dad's written for my mum but i'm wearing a look murder uh, t-shirt as well but they, that's 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 being love a 14 year old um well. were you like a proper sort of straight edge uh, what, do, what do they call yeah is that what they call it in hardcore circles i was i was vegan for like two years and uh, sorry uh, straight edge for like two years but i mean <laughs> straight edge i was 14 <laughs> that bus stop where you could do the skateboarding that had absolute sort of uh drink inside at a bus stop written all over it i thought that was where that story was going until you started talking about doing wheelies or whatever it was there were plenty of periods where that was going on but there was a sort of two-year period where i was um straight edge and then yeah but i was vegan for like pretty much my entire teens you look like a jarman brother in oh this my photo, god yeah you really you know. do do i you just look very teenage yeah and lip ring is there a lip ring going on am i just imagining that because it looks like you should have one probably just i should have had one i'm trying because i think i was too young to have it's definitely a necklace there is a necklace but it's um it's got <laughs> charms on it yeah. <laughs> oh yeah it's yeah. one of those yes. classic sort of like <laughs> you, you know, your lyrics, vaccine songs, are you, you know, you're, you're a man of words. You're, you're a poet. You're a modern poet. There's romance in there. You're wearing it on your sleeve. I feel like this story adds up. Okay, good. I'm glad. The only thing I've got on my sleeve in that photo is a um, sweatband, which, <laughs> were, again, were there. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, but I was, had a big sweatband period. And vaccines kicked off. You got signed when you were early 20s. Yeah. So at this point, you're quite a way off from then. Transplanting mm. yourself back then, do you think you had it in your mind that that could have happened? I don't think that success in music feels attainable until you start to like get within touching distance of it. I think that, or it certainly didn't to me. Like, I didn't know anyone that was successful. I think once I moved to London and started playing four or five nights a week 
and meeting people that were like a rung above me or two or three rungs above me. And I realized they weren't kind of like superhuman. They were like people that were doing what I was doing six months previously. Then it started to feel like more attainable. But I think when you're like growing up in your hometown, I don't think you really, I don't think it really feels like it's like a possibility. Mm. Did you move to London with the sort of like, I want to get down and be a, you know, even if it's just playing around the sort of toilet circuits, you know, open mic nights, stuff like that. Like, was that always the idea when you moved down here? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I moved, I, I only applied to London universities because I, I didn't want to live anywhere else. Mm. And even just being in like, I guess just even being within pro- in like the proximity of, of like, it's like, I don't know, success isn't the right word, but like what was the things that were like, you know, happening. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. It just felt like there was nowhere else really. It just felt like you couldn't make anything happen unless you were in London, I guess. So that's what it felt like to me. You mentioned the Astoria too earlier. That was, that was big for me coming down from Watford, where I'm from, and going to the Astoria and the Astoria too were just huge. You know, it was every weekend, yeah. maybe twice a week. And I'd go down after school to a sold out show and get concession tickets if there were any. Were you going up on the train? Would your parents let you go up and, and, and do your thing? Yeah, they would once. I, I mean, like not, not when I was super young, but like, I guess like mid to late teens, they started to let me do that stuff. And I um, would go up. I, I remember I used to go to like the academy in like Islington quite a lot yeah. for some reason oh, yeah. and the underworld. Um, I remember going to see quite a few things at like the underworld yeah. and Camden. Um, so yeah, I would, I mean, it just felt like, I don't know. I think as long as I can remember, I just wanted to get to London. Basically. Mm-hmm. What I want to know is cause I remember before the vaccines, you obviously had a solo thing under JJ Pistole, the golden years, um, like, which was so much more sort of, I mean, that was very much in that kind of Laura Marling, you know, we're in the way all kind of new folk time yeah. of London. Like, how did you get from pop punk to playing that? Cause that wouldn't have even been, that would have only been what, like six, seven years later. Yeah, but like I said earlier, I think like that's like seventy years when you're a kid. It's like I think that probably, like I was probably into like, like when I was like twelve, thirteen, got into like grunge through Nirvana and like got into like Seattle and was probably into like probably into like cooler stuff. And then I was like thirteen or fourteen, um, and like say like discovered girls and stuff. I like, got into pop punk, and then that led to like punk rock and hardcore and all that kind of stuff. And then through that, I I guess I got into like like alt sort of like alt country and americana and which is which is again it's like not a million miles away from punk rock there's like some mm. sort of like crossover i right? mm. like attitude and presentation and stuff and i played in my sick form band was a kind of like almost like alt country band or something we liked like wilco and the old 97s and tom petty and uh, uncle tupelo yeah. and whiskey town and stuff like that <laughs> and um and, and then when I moved to London, none of my friends wanted to move to London. I basically just went solo, I guess, because I didn't know anyone to start a band with. So it was kind of out of necessity more than choice, really. Mm. There's so much, like, you've had so many different sort of fate. Like, what at what point did you have, because I guess, you know, vaccines isn't really any of those things. It's something, uh, I don't know, maybe more like kind of just cl- classic like indie rock and roll like when did you have that I mean you mentioned like Elvis and the Beatles and stuff like were they always maybe around the same time as pop punk maybe I had like a six month one year NME phase where I like got the first strokes record and like vines white stripes like all that kind of stuff like I I, you know I must I must have had that I did have that phase and I had a kind of like I liked, like I said, I liked Muse and radio. I, I remember I used to, I used to get, I got NME and I think Melody Maker was still around and I think Q and I would just, so I, I, I actually like was, I guess I liked a lot of different things. So I probably, my pop punk phase wasn't an exclusively pop punk phase. It was mm. probably like happening at the same time that I was into indie rock. But from the age of like 14, 15 onwards, I didn't really have an indie rock phase and wasn't really listening to indie rock when we started the vaccines either. It kind of, just sounded like ended up come it ended up sounding like that because that those were the kind of people in the room or something it's weird it sort of happened by mistake really and i probably listen to more indie rock now 
I got into indie rock when everybody started telling us we sounded like certain bands. And then I was like, oh, they're great. Like, you know, and I, 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 um, I never really had like an indie rock phase, I don't think. Like, I guess like Arctic Monkeys, a, a case in point, like I, I didn't listen to that first Arctic Monkeys record. It just wasn't what I was interested at the time in at the time. And then we went on and then we went on tour with them like a bunch in like 2011. And just I just I became such a huge fan. And now I like listen to them all the time. And yeah. it was like it was it was kind of that wasn't what I was listening to when I was a teenager. You know? Yeah, just sort of reverse engineered it into this kind yeah, of. Exactly. <laughs> But what you were listening to as a teenager is so the object that you've chosen is now I even Giles yeah. Giles who is a big sort of punk man had not heard of Plasma Plasma Reliance Plasma Reliance yeah When you google it it just comes up as um some sort of like blood donation thing That is one of the reasons I chose it because it, it kind of also ties into all this stuff we're talking about, like exposure and access and everything. Like I re-Googled them the other day and hardly anything came back. And every three or four years, I will re-Google them um, because at the time I knew absolutely nothing about them. But actually, the re- the, the re- I've got it here. The reason why I ch- is the first seven inch single I ever had. And my aunt actually bought it for me in the lanes in Brighton. Nice. Um, because she knew I liked hardcore punk and someone, it must have been in the hardcore punk section and someone must have just told her, oh, just get him, get him this. <laughs> um, and I remember getting it at Christmas. I think I was, prob- I was again, really, I think I must have been 12 or 13 um, and I couldn't find anything about them, knew nothing about them. There's a free Leonard uh, Peltier thing on the back. He's still in jail. He's a, he's, he's a Native American activist. He's still in jail today. Um, but what was funny, and this shows how young I was, and I just checked and it tells you what speed to play it at, um, but I didn't even know what speed to play it at. So for like the first year of having it, I would either play it at like 45 or 33 or whatever, because um, I just didn't know what speed it was supposed to be played at. Um, and it is on YouTube, and and, and I, I went and I went and um, looked just now, uh, or yesterday or whatever, and um, and uh, it's obviously at the right speed on YouTube. But um, uh yeah, it's one of those things where I, I really loved it, but literally knew nothing about it to the point where I didn't even know what speed I was supposed to be listening to it at. It's the mystery. Um, and, you know, how... It, and the allure. The mystery and how often... You know, exactly, and you don't really get that anymore, I guess. Um, and it was the first seven-inch I ever had. They're from Ohio. Um, uh, in fact, sorry, that's not true. They're from... Oh, yeah, they are from Ohio. But, uh, yeah, look at that there. Record labels, addresses on the back, Michigan. Yes. Nice. Nice. Um, yeah, there's also a picture of Hendrix on the cover. If that was something that she just sort of knew to get you as a 12 year old, like had even, because I mean, that's pretty young to be having. Like, I think when I was 12, I was just listening to, like, I don't know, is that still a Spice Girls face? Maybe that's a bit old for that, but like, definitely nothing that had that much personal taste attached. Like, I was very much still just listening to what was on the radio. Whereas, like, had you sort of started developing that kind of level of like personality already there was a guy in the year above me at school who i just just really loved and he, i thought it was so cool i don't know how he got exposed to it all but like when i was yeah 12 he started giving me all this like hardcore stuff and i even found a there was a quite good local hardcore scene in southampton and i, I uh, it was like a diy um promoter called ste and they would put uh, gigs on above this pub near St. Mary's football ground. And, um, uh, you know, I found a write up the other day where they were talking about it was, they were freaked out by the fact there were these 12 year olds wearing crass shirts that we, <laughs> you know, like my dad drove me there and we played like, I was like playing in a hardcore band when we were like 12, 13, 14. Um, and there were like people who were much older, you know, who they were like, freshers at university and stuff who like took us under their wing and would like take us on these animal rights marches and stuff and i quite amazed my parents let us let, let me do all this because i was like really young but yeah i i was exposed to it at a young age i was like really like i guess fascinated by it all and the, the community and and the you know the connection and all that kind of stuff and yeah. And like I say, that this was happening at the same time. I was like finding merit in things like the Ataris and all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, just like soaking up everything I could, I guess. Yeah. 
I still love the Spice Girls as well. Yeah, obviously. Like, who doesn't? Um, who, did your parents, like, they were never, they were always quite supportive of all of these musical pursuits. They were never sort of telling you to turn that racket off. No, never. They never did. But, like, they would definitely, like, work hard at school because you're not going to be a musician. <laughs> My school bands, they used to let us rehearse their, like, twice a week. And I was in, like, a, I was in, like, a power violence band, which is, like, a really, like, niche kind of like type of hardcore punk and we would play we would play like every tuesday and every thursday like in my front room and my parents would just like go sit in the kitchen and just like let us do it what does power um, violence would, mean there's a whole i actually made i made a i made a power violence um playlist on the vaccine spotify the other day and shared it to our stories and it got like seven followers so i made it private again. <laughs> um, excellent but uh yeah, it's quite uh, niche, um, I yeah. suppose. Well, no, maybe not that niche. I think it's got a, it's got a pretty consistent uh, uh, following. When you were a kid, were you properly like doing the get on the stage, jump off the thing? I don't think I've ever seen you crowd surf as a vaccines man. No, I, I used to, I used to crowd surf on our first record, and I'd wear these like our managers like you got to get buy nice clothes now. You're doing well, like to wear on stage, and so I'd buy all these like fucking expensive shirts, and then. And then they just get ripped to shreds every gig. So I was like, I don't know how I see like Yanis. I see like Yanis from Bowls wearing like Bodie shirts and Casablanca shirts, which cost like 700 quid. And he's like in the pit every night. So I don't know if he, I don't know if they tour with like a seamstress or something, <laughs> but like, I, I, I'm on, I, honestly, I'm always like that poor shirt. Yeah. Cause I just like, I, yeah, I lost really good men in those, in those vaccines pits. So I stopped doing it. Like obviously 90% of what we've spoken about is like music and and the bands that you're into and stuff does that mean that like did you have like lots of other aside from obviously being a very hardcore protesting vegan um was it like just full music all the time or did you have sort of like these other passions when you were younger that were vying for your when I was really young football obviously and then like when I discovered like skateboarding music that those two took over really and that was like it's never really anything else no when was the last time you got on a board I was probably too old. I think you're allowed to skateboard when you're at any age if you're good. <laughs> but you're not allowed to skateboard over like 25 if you're still bad, I think. In my opinion. In the my dream opinion. is getting to 40s, maybe even 50s, and putting the knee pads on and just going for a carve. Yeah. That's the dream. Yeah. Actually, one a cool story, which I, I do think is cool. I probably told once or twice, but I try not to like name drop he wasn't even there but a mutual a friend of ours when we were on tour in san diego was like do you want to come to tony's house and we were like tony you and he was like tony Hawk." he said we can go and skateboard at his house so like we went and skateboard at, at, skateboarding at his house when we were on tour a few years ago which oh was that was probably one of the last times i was on skateboard. also oh, no. that's terrifying right that's like being like hey do you want to go and have a sing song with like paul mccartney like that's the sort of highest level but he wasn't there he wasn't even at his house he just let us go to his okay, house that's better then so yeah. it's more like doing mccartney at karaoke <laughs> <laughs> but in like a really really convincing beatles themed room when you guys played ali valley and had fucked up sporting and there was all these kids in the front row that were just like ah what is who is this terrifying i came for indie and now this now pink eyes is like getting all up in my grill and i feel like maybe people were surprised that your band would pick like a punk band like that but i feel like now we have sort of joined a lot of the dots of some of these things and like actually not coming I from so. the strokes place coming from a gnarlier place <laughs> As it were i probably haven't spent as much time talking about that as you'd expect but 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 because i guess no one ever really asks but i guess people assume that indie rock was like on the pinterest mm. you know board or whatever when we started but it wasn't really like it it just i think a bit like i always used to say though a bit like the ramones i don't think the ramones were listening to punk they were listening to like you know like girl groups mm. and like kind of 50s 60s pop and stuff and then they just and then they just ended up being a punk man i think maybe there's like we were doing something similar in the sense that we weren't listening to the bands we sounded like we, w we were listening to other things but then we sounded like those bands because of the way you know the instruments we had at our disposal 
That was Justin Young of The Vaccines on the latest episode of Before They Knew Better with DIY Magazine. Thank you again for listening. If you want to listen to more episodes of this podcast, who have we had so far? James A. Caster, mm-hmm. Remy Wolf, Felix White, we have had Killer Mike, and so many. You know what? There's actually too many to list now because we are but one singular episode away from the end of this first series of Before They Knew Better. So we've had this is number 11. There's 10 more to go back and listen to, and we would strongly advise that you do all of those things it was good chat with justin wasn't it we learned a lot we were very surprised about him being vegan straight edge going on marches you know you think of justin yeah you think of vaccines they're kind of clean shirts aren't they yeah <laughs> is this offensive <laughs> yeah but vaccines know they've got clean shirts on i mean look at the record cover yeah look, exactly. at, the, look at their photos they are clean shirts they they're are. making clean shirts cool <laughs> very well ironed men and for that we salute them. And you can catch him on tour in January. Two shows at Kingston with Banquet Records at Prism. I'll be there. And then they're doing a, looks like a record shop tour. Pie and Vinyl in Portsmouth. Content in Liverpool. Rough Trade East. Vaccines.com for that stuff. If you liked this episode, you can subscribe, can't you, Lisa? You, you can, can like, indeed. rate and review it before they knew better by DIY Magazine. One more episode to come at the start of January. We're not going to say who it is, but it's a good one. Yes, we like them very much here at DIY Magazine. If you are enjoying the podcast and you enjoy the other work of DIY Magazine, uh, why not go and pick up our new issue? It's a big bumper December, January double issue. It is our class of 2024 featuring all the hot and -and up-and-coming new bands and artists that you probably want to get in on early before they blow up, man, blow up into the stratosphere. That is online now, and you can also subscribe to the magazine and if you want to go and witness some of these bands in a live arena uh, then we have DIY's Now and Next Tour 2024 that is going throughout the country in April with Hot Wax and Big Special as co-headliners DIY best magazine on earth (laughs) thanks Giles I agree Um, go and do all those things have a very Merry Christmas a Happy New Mm -hmm. Year and we'll see you in 2024